Welcome to Three Thinkers Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, along with my co-host, Chad and Erkan. And today we have a guest who actually happens to be my second cousin, Patrice Apodaca. We haven't met in person before, but uh, when I was thinking about some great guests we could have on an upcoming podcast, um, I was like, you know what, let me reach out to Patrice. And I actually, I had never reached out to Patrice before, but I asked the family members, hey, I know Patrice is a writer. I, I think Patrice has some interesting takes in her articles. And I asked some family members up here, what's Patrice like? And everyone said, Patrice is great. Patrice is so, is so nice and friendly. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to message Patrice and say, hey, I am your second cousin. Would you like to come on my podcast? And so here we are. Um, Patrice, maybe you can just kind of give our uh, viewers and listeners a little more background on what you do. Okay, uh, great. Well, thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is a lot of fun. Um, I am a journalist and um, that's pretty much all I've done my entire career. Um, I'm a California native and um, I spent a good part of my career as a staff writer at the LA Times. Um, when my kids were young, the, the reporting lifestyle got a little untenable, so I left um, full-time uh, journalism and just became a freelance writer. And um, so I've written a lot of you know freelance magazine pieces. Uh, I'd say newspapers are my first love. Um, because, uh, it, you know, it's fast moving, it changes every day. Um, so I came up with the idea of um, writing a column and I uh, pitched the idea of uh, writing a column for one of the LA Times' uh, satellite publications that publishes in Orange County, uh, California. And um, my idea at the time this was many, many years ago when I first started it. Um, I'd been out of full-time work for a while and kind of like really got into the PTA mom thing. And I was just blown away by, um, by the PTA moms. I mean, a lot of them were like really smart, well-educated. Um, a lot of them were professional women. And man, I'm telling you, PTA moms should be running the country. Um, so my idea as I pitched it was, I just want to write about the things that the other moms are talking about with each other, whatever that is. And so uh, the editor said, great, sounds good, go for it. And um, I've been doing that for many years. And um I pretty much write about whatever I want to write about, which is really fun. So whatever kind of strikes my fancy, I write a lot about education, um, sometimes parenting trends. Um, I am really, uh, I, I think that um, uh, educational inequality is one of the biggest problems in our country. Um, so I write a lot about different aspects of that issue. Um, whether it's student debt crisis or um, college admissions or um, the lack of universal pre-K, um, you name it, I'll, I'll write about it. Um, and I'll, you know, obviously do some reporting and talk to people who are way smarter uh, than me uh, to kind of um, help form my thoughts and, and my opinions. Um, so I've been doing that for many years and I love it. It's a great gig. And I also, um, a few years ago, co-wrote a book, which if you don't mind my slightly pitching here, um, a boy named courage. There we go. There's the boy. Um, so it's his story. I wrote it, um, of a, um, a uh, fascinating man, a retired cardiac surgeon who grew up a, um, a man of color in apartheid South Africa, and how that experience of living with and overcoming uh, racism and oppression, how it, it shaped his life. And um, 
uh, really fascinating story, which gripped me. I offered to write it and he enthusiastically agreed and we had a great time, really wonderful time um, getting together and writing that. Um, and it was an interesting process because writing someone else's memoir as um, a lot of ghostwriters, I'm not a ghostwriter, I actually got a credit on it, but um, a lot of ghostwriters will write memoirs. And uh, one of the tricky parts of it is trying to capture someone else's voice. You, like you're trying to faithfully recreate their life and their memories and write it in a way that sounds like them, not like you. So, um, so that was an interesting project. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then in the past few years, I've just been back to writing my column and trying to fight the good fight about uh, educational inequality and the importance of treating teachers well and, um, and whatever other topic strikes my fancy. So that's me. Great. Chad, do you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah. P thanks, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, Patrice. Um, you know, I, I noticed that in some of your columns, you write about both sort of um, uh, in inequities, inequalities, but uh, also a little bit about um, the the cost of college and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm wanting to talk about both, but I, I think I'd like to talk first, if you don't mind, about your thoughts about sort of how how do we how do we direct resources? What what do we do here? Um, are and, and how did we get here? How did we get to such inequities in the school system, especially maybe in that K through 12 or K through eight sort of range? What are your, what are your thoughts about how we got there and maybe how do, how do we get out of it? Wow. Um, yeah. um, I don't want to pass myself off as an expert, um, which I'm not, I'm a journalist. So um, usually the one asking the questions but um, you're really getting to the heart of it. And um, I would have to say that um, it's been a problem in this country from the very beginning. And we have built a system. So it's a system-wide problem. We built a structure um, that guarantees inequity. Um, I say one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest problems did you, did you lose me just there? Okay. Um, sorry, got distracted by a call on my phone. Um, one of the biggest problems is the way we fund education, um, which almost guarantees inequity. I know in, um, in California, for instance, um, the problem grew exponentially worse back um, when we, pro um, we passed Proposition 13, which, um, you know, uh, in most states, um, schools, public schools are funded largely through property taxes, um, which is a highly unequal way to fund education, because if you base it on property taxes, obviously, in more affluent areas, you're going to have more money. Um, going in. Um, and it's just, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's really crazy because if you go to a school, say, for example, where I live in Newport Beach, California, um, you know, the schools are, are fantastic. The, I mean, the resources we have here are, are amazing. Um, you go a few miles away to um, a less affluent neighborhood, and you're going to see a totally different public school. Um, the kids, you know, might not have uh, technology. They, uh, they might come to school hungry. And, um, you know, some of them are homeless. Um, that's not the fault of the schools, but this is what teachers are dealing with. And then at the schools, the teachers and the administrators are not given all the resources and tools they need to help overcome that, to help deal with all the myriad issues that come from working in, um, in impoverished communities. You'll find that same problem across the country. So, so funding, the way we fund education is, is a huge, huge issue. And you know, one of the points I like to make is that 
you know, we have this attitude in the US that everyone has an equal opportunity. Um, all you need to do is pull yourself up by the bootstraps and um, education is the way to do that. Um, but not every kid, you know, is given the bootstraps to pull themselves up with, you know, you need the bootstraps in the first place, right? You need to have a basic foundation to work with. If you're going to school um, and you're not getting the same education that the kid living a few miles away is getting, then you're automatically starting out life at a disadvantage. So by the time it comes to apply for college, you've got so many things working against you. And it's really tragic that, um, that we don't recognize this and we seem to have a failure of will in this country to do anything really um, substantive uh, about it. Um, I think it requires a national response. And again, that's something we're kind of allergic to in this country. Um, we look at it as a state problem, as a local problem. Um, I think to really overcome um, educational inequality, we need a nationwide effort. Um, whether we'll ever get to that place, I don't know. Um, a few years ago, we had something called the Common Core. Sure, it had its problems. It was not necessarily the correct solution, um, but the, the opposition to it really was more of an ideological opposition where it was just the idea of the federal government trying to impose um, some kind of educational framework upon the states was just seen as anathema to who we are as a people, which is, I think, kind of crazy that we think that way. So, so I think, you know, really, uh, you know, part of the problem is cultural. Um, also, of course, now, you know, this might be veering off on another topic, but now, um, some of the gains that have been made in making um, education more inclusive, um, which would I believe would help um, equalize things because in, in uh, low income communities, communities of color, minority communities, a lot of times um, I think students check out because the, some of the curriculum, some of the material isn't relevant to their lives. And there have been attempts to remedy that in recent years. And now we're seeing the cultural backlash against that, such as what we're seeing in Florida um, with, you know, whether it's the don't say gay uh, bill or what um, uh, Governor DeSantis is, is doing with the, um, sort of anti-CRT backlash. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of answers to your big question, but I think um, it kind of starts with um, who we are as a people and, um, and what we wanna achieve in this country and how we have to start approaching education um, differently and make it more, more inclusive and more equitable. I, I wanted to jump in real quick and, and say that I think you hit upon several important points um, in that the big, in the big picture, that the educational inequality is kind of just built in, right? For example, when you're young or when, if you live in a particular town, everyone knows what the, where, which schools are affluent, where the affluent kids go to school and everyone knows the schools where people have less money and they have more struggle it's almost ingrained as the kind of the status quo and you're right if someone goes to school and they're at a level with their family with their family situation or their community situation where all they have to do is study right they just study they don't have to worry about food they don't have to worry about shelter 
it's you know it's way easier to study in those in that situation than yeah if you're homeless or you know there's many children in in America that they get most of their meals from school because they don't have enough food at at um at home so i think i think you're right it, it would take like a national response and kind of a cultural change that education for everyone is is a real priority and um is like a center point so that's that's just something i want to add i want to know if Urkan, if you wanted to jump in if you had some thoughts on what you've heard so far well um well my initial thoughts are that you know it's just an observation really but um i'm british and britain is notoriously um you know um uh described as uh, a class a class like based society you know social classes and, and it just yeah and just the structure that you just described patrice is just it's kind of ironic because you know it's normally the other side of the pond to you guys which is uh described as the, the sort of class-based system but it seems to me that in 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 a whole range of um context and certainly in education based on your description um you have a class system going on there, right? I mean, it's like a kind of caster system or something, you know? Yeah. Um, it's just an observation at this stage. I mean, I yeah, I'm just kind of shocked. I, to, I, that, that is absolutely correct. And, and we have a kind of myopia about that. We don't acknowledge it as readily as we should, that our society is very classist. And that certainly manifests in, in the education system. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a little bit of a backlash, um, you know, a backlash to the backlash to the backlash. But um, uh, I write a lot about college admissions and how that whole process is a reflection of the inequality we're talking about. Um, I think one of the, um, the columns that uh, you guys might have seen that I wrote was um, a little bit tug in cheek, but to make a point where um, it was my, my don't apply to Harvard um, column. And, um, you know, the point I'm making is that um, we automatically assume that anyone who goes to an Ivy League college here, well, they must be really smart, right? No, they're rich. Like 90, I, yeah, I don't have the statistics, but most of the people who go to Ivy League or other elite institutions come from um, an affluent background or, or they have connections or they have some other leg up that got them in. Um, maybe, they're, maybe they're there on an athletic scholarship or you know, they're a chess prodigy but, or something. You know? But for the most part, it's people who have help getting there. And it's the kids who don't have help, but have plenty of, of potential, but just don't get the shot. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, the, the classes system, yeah, that is a prime example of it. And um, so my point in the column was, was, hey, everybody out there, stop applying to Harvard, because the only way we're going to um, to break the wheel using a Game of Thrones reference is if we start rebelling, we start, we stop buying into this system and forcing a change. And a little bit is starting to change around the margins. Um, I've been writing for years about how much I hate the SAT. Um, any kid who's ever taken the SAT hates the SAT. I watched like YouTube video after YouTube video of kids like, you know, doing things like throwing their computers across, you know, the room and, you know, ripping up their study guides for the SAT, just all this, you know, theatrical response to how hideous the SAT is. Well, now a lot of universities suddenly have decided, okay, we're going to stop requiring the SAT for admissions. The SAT is just another facet of how we advantage certain people. If you come from an affluent background, you are automatically gonna score higher on the SAT. And it has also been shown in some studies to, to be 
uh, more favorable to white people um, because of certain certain terminology or you know it, different ways that the test has been structured. And no matter how many times they tweaked it, there were still issues. Um, so, you know, little things like that. Um, there are some other changes that, that some um, uh, universities are making in their admission systems, but a lot of it is just kind of, you know, tweaking around the edges and not, and not you know, dealing with some of the more fundamental issues, which is that our entire system of education from the youngest age is just stacked against some students. Uh, so th thank Go you, ahead. Patrice. So, so one of the things that occurs to me as you're saying that is that in a way you have either vicious circles or virtuous circles, so to speak. Where yeah. If you already are disadvantaged, you're going to continue to probably be disadvantaged through you know multiple grades, multiple problems that you're gonna going to encounter. If you're already kind of ahead of the game, you know, if you already you know have some affluence, if uh, your your parents you know have the time, have the money, have the have value education, even even something as simple as that is that they do value education. Something like that puts you at an advantage. Uh, you know, I've seen studies, and some of these studies have methodological problems. Some of them have come into question. But I've seen studies that suggest that you know more exposure to language earlier on makes a difference, can, you know, gives you some advantage. And again, some of those studies have come into question, but nonetheless, that seems to make, make some sense. Given that, you know, parents are going to, you know, they're going to give every advantage they can to their own children. Um, I think that's, it's just a natural tendency. It's oh a natural God. thing that they're, they're going to yeah. want to do. Yeah. So what, do you, do you think that in some ways, some of them have to step away from that. Is that is that realistic, or is there some other kind of solution? Or as you said, do we just sort of go on strike, so to speak, and say we're going to stop applying to some of these places, or we're going to uh, re reject the very ideas of some of these uh, these ladders, so to speak? Yeah, I, you know, I don't think there's any one specific answer. That's that's a great question. Um, I in no way blame parents. For any of this. Um, as you said, we all want the best for our kids. All of us do, you know, whether it's it's someone living um, in luxury or someone who's struggling to put food on the table. We all want the best for our kids. Um, however, we have shown how extreme it can get. Um, the uh, Operation Varsity Blues scandal started right here where I am in Newport Beach, California, Rick Singer, the orchestrator of that uh, scandal. And just if anybody's not familiar with it, I will- we, briefly, Yeah, definitely. If you could just tell us all about it. Yeah. So the Operation Varsity Blues scandal, um, when I first heard about it, I'm like, of course, of course somebody did this, right? Okay. so. In an affluent community, like where I live, everybody sends their kids, um, their high school kids to private college counselors. You know, people have the money, they spend the extra money because they figure this will help their kids. I don't blame parents for doing that. Of course, they want to make sure their kids are doing everything they can to get into the school of their dreams, whatever that may be or to find the right fit. That's another, um, that's other terminology you often hear. I want the right fit for my kid. It's like, well, if Harvard comes knocking, is that the right fit? Whatever, but um, so there was a college counselor here who um, took it um, several steps too far into criminality. He developed uh, relationships with um, people on various campuses at different universities um, around the country. Um, and uh, he would um, pay sometimes uh, coaches, um, sometimes um, I believe admissions officers uh, on these campuses. Um, with money that came from the parents 
uh, to get their kids into schools they might not otherwise qualify for. Um, and it, it went to almost like hilarious comic extremes. He would have kids, for example, pose like doing sports that they never did. I think um, there were a few actors whose kids were caught up in this. Um, the actor, uh, Lori Laughlin from Full House, um, Felicity Huffman, who I, I don't know, I never watched any of these shows. I believe she was in Desperate Housewives, a show like that. Anyway, they were famous. They're, you know, they were wealthy. Their kids um, wanted to go to USC or whatever, wherever they wanted to go to. And um, they, uh, I, I can't remember whose kid this was, but one of them was, um, had a way in through the crew, the, the women's crew. Um, and she actually posed a photo of um, the kid sitting like in some rowing machine, like she was training and she'd never, never done this before in her life. But that's how she got in to, I believe it was USC. So it, it went to almost comic lengths sometimes, but it was, it was such a far reaching conspiracy. I mean, he was paying off test takers to, um, to either uh, fudge the results or actually have um, stand-ins take the SAT and ACT for these students. Um, so huge scandal. Um, it broke, a, I believe, about three years ago, and charges were filed. A lot of people went to prison, including the orchestrator of it, the college counselor, Rick Singer. So um, as I said, when I first heard about it, I kind of wasn't surprised. I mean, it was ballsy. Yeah, it was brazen. Um, but was it shocking? Not really, because I think that we almost have opened the door to this attitude of you have to do whatever it takes to get your kid into a great school. Um, not everybody uh, thinks that way, but among a certain subset of um, parents and students, there is that kind of pressure, that, that cultural and societal pressure to have the bragging rights of getting into a name brand school. And it's such a warped system. Um, I could go on and on about this all day, but the other part of this is kind of what I see as the university's culpability in this beyond just some um, some corrupt uh, people who worked for the universities who had been bribed, but beyond that of creating this environment of, of kind of, you know, doing whatever it takes because um, for a long time, a lot of universities have willfully accepted huge donations um, from alumni with the sort of tacit understanding, well, if you donate this wing of a building, then of course your kid's gonna get in. Nobody will say it out loud, but that's the way it works and everybody knows it. So is it really a big leap from there to full on criminality if we've already got a skewed classes system? So, um, so yeah, so the Operation Varsity Blues, I believe, just came out of environment that we as a nation have, have created and perpetuated in college admissions. Erkan, you had uh, something you wanted to add? Um, <clears throat> well, no, I just, I, I wonder what you think, uh, Patrice. Um, you just touched on something I was thinking about just right before you said it, um, which is, I wonder if, do you think there's an overemphasis on academic pursuit as well? Like, do you think that there should be, you know, because do you think what, what um, I guess my point is, how much credence do you give to this argument that some people, they end up 
at university. They, they, they think it's the, you know, they think it's the ultimate goal, the ultimate prize, but maybe, maybe they're not academic, right? Maybe they're not academically gifted and they don't belong there and they're going to get left behind in a certain group of, among a certain cohort of scholars. And um, yeah, and then that's going to make their experience at university even worse if they're not academically cut out for that environment or, you know, or it's not, not the right course for them or they're just going for the badge of honour, like you said, the, the, the certain university, the name, the brand. So what do you think about um, an argument like that, which comes from yeah. um, Heather McDonald and people like that? What would you, you know, what would you, what would you say? I think, I think that's a great point. And, you know, absolutely a four-year university is not for everyone. Um, but what I will say is I think education is for everyone, whatever form that might take. And we need to, in sort of rethinking the way we do things, consider that very carefully. Um, everyone should have educational opportunities, but that might not include necessarily the four-year university track. And we need to support students in whatever track they think is, is best for them. You see, um, as a... As a Sorry, Patrice, I just to jump in. As a, as a sociologist, I wonder about things like um, deindustrialization in Western societies and this kind of thing. And what are the alternatives? But if somebody wants to get ahead, get ahead, as it were, you know, um, you've got things like we've kind of scaled down, you know, investment in industry and in, in, in trades and this and this and that. Um, and you wonder about the other, and then of course you've got things like gender politics and things like when you talk about leveling and equalizing things. Um, and there are those arguments about, you know, well, girls gravitate to certain professions anyway, even in places, you know, Jordan Peterson makes this point about in Scandinavia where they, they have this push towards gender equality, for example. Um, and then he makes the point that the data is in, women and girls tend to um, gravitate towards certain professions. So you can't necessarily, his argument is you can't necessarily force equality. Um, so it's, yeah, I just wonder about, um, so all of these factors, you know, deindustrialization, um, the descaling, the all of these factors that kind of coalesce, that kind of makes it a bit more complicated, doesn't it? You know, about- um, Well, th yeah, for sure it's complicated. I would take issue with that characterization. Um, I don't think women gravitate towards certain professions. I think certain professions are the ones that are open to them. And out of necessity, you know, they go where the opportunity lies. I think um, we start um, girls off on a track early on, and this is changing, thank God, um, very early on where they are often discouraged from pursuing STEM fields, for instance, because it's not considered, um, you know, something that girls are good at. That That is definitely changing for the better, So so that's good. Um, you know, it, it, it's a complicated question. Um, I used to write um, for a long time when I was at the LA Times, I, I wrote uh, for the business section. And when you talk to any employer out there, um, they would uh, tell me, and I would hear this over and over and over again, is we can teach our employees how to do things like operate machinery or work on a computer or compile a whatever, whatever the field is, they can teach them the nuts and bolts of that job. They said, what we need are employees who can think critically. And that's what we're not getting. Um, I did one really interesting um, story uh, many, many years ago which ran, um, actually ended up running on the front page of the LA Times. And 
it was back when um, we were just starting to have a real blossoming of, um, of uh, digital arts, um, you know, movies, TV shows, commercials. It was just, it was migrating from it just being like special effects are used in science fiction movies to, you know, digital everything in any kind of uh, filmed entertainment. And so the industry was just taking off and there were, there were opportunities aplenty. And the problem was um, you went, if you would go to um, any of the, the companies in Hollywood that were overseeing this, this huge boom in, in opportunity, um, they were finding they had to hire more employees from other countries. And the problem was that um, they couldn't find enough people who, um, who knew how to draw. They had no artistic uh, sensibility or, or understanding. Um, they had no composition skills. Um, they didn't understand the artistic side of the business. And that was because um, we started de-emphasizing the arts in school. So um, after my story ran, there was actually um, in Sacramento, the capital of California, there was definitely um, a lot of rethinking being done about how um, maybe we need to look at that problem. Um, so, you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, well, you know, college might not be right for everybody, that is absolutely true. But um, again, I go back to education, whatever the form that might come in um, is important for everybody. We need people who can think and think critically. I remember when my older son uh, first went to college, he came home and he said something that made my mama heart just, you know, just burst. It was so great. He said, I wish everybody could learn what I'm learning. And I thought, that's awesome. That is so what I wanna hear. Um, that, that's so great. Um, you know, we need to encourage learning. And I, I might sound like, um, you know, kind of a, a softy here, but learning for learning's sake has value. Um, I believe in that deeply to my core and um, the benefits accumulate throughout your life of just, not just knowing stuff, but, knowing how to approach a task, a project, a deadline, um, think about it and produce something that has meaning and depth. And, um, and that I think is at least something that lends itself to a more successful, fulfilling life. I wanted to jump in real quick because you mentioned something that I've said in conversations with Chad and Urkan at different moments is this obsession with placing a monet. This is a particular to me, an American thing to put the value of a degree on how much value you would add economically to a company. Right. So somebody gets a degree in philosophy because they want to learn the value of critical thinking. They want to learn, the classics and how to think and you know they had come out with a lot of debt you know and someone's like huh, should have got it should have got a stem degree well it's like well maybe that person's not looking to get a stem degree maybe that's not what they're aimed towards why why maybe they're it? looking to go into law right maybe they're it, looking to go because into law. because actually philosophy is a great one if you want to go into law but you know you guys know what i'm talking about because i get you know in france or germany you do you think there's anyone who's like, I got a, a philosophy degree. My parents think I threw my educational, my, my, I threw their money away. No, no. Cause there's value 
and critical learning how to critically think. I don't want to live in a society full of people who just do STEM. I want arts and humanities. I want people who are excited to write a book or 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 to you know become a painter or whatever. So do you feel like there's too much emphasis on STEM in our society? Because that's that's how I feel. I feel like you don't not everyone is going to be an engineer or a mathematician. And and when you make it so expensive, because this is probably a good segue into like the student debt crisis, when you make it so expensive, then you force people to just view it through the lens of how economically valuable their degree is to, let's be honest, make money for someone else. So, yeah, no, Kevin, that I, I completely agree with you. And I actually wrote a column about just what you said. Um, I totally agree. Um, another another facet to this topic that um, I think is worth mentioning is um, what we see, for example, I, I mentioned before the, um, the backlash against um, this perception that we're teaching uh, critical race theory in, um, in our schools, which is, is very misguided. Um, also the backlash against vaccines. Um, I feel like, you know, I could draw a straight line from a lack of education to that kind of thinking. Um, you know, there's kind of a, an anti-science uh, movement going on in this country. And, um, you know, strangely enough, kind of an anti-history uh, movement as well. Our history, um, when we talk about uh, you know, it, the, the term critical race theory or CRT is, is just being tossed around as this sort of blanket term. I don't think people, most people who use it even know what it is. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, um, with wanting, um, with wanting certain aspects of our history to be told in all their complexity, we need we need those stories to be told. Um, I shouldn't have to learn that there was one of the biggest race-based massacres in our nation that took place in Tulsa. I shouldn't have to learn about that by watching a superhero TV show. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it was the Tulsa race massacre. It was horrible. It happened in the 1920s. Are kids taught about that in school? I don't think so. I never was. Um, I didn't learn about a very important court case that took place right here in Orange County where I live that was a precursor to Brown v. Board of Education, the, um, the landmark case that desegregated schools nationwide. The case that opened the door for Brown was Mendez versus Westminster. And that, that started here in Orange County with the desegregation of schools. And that went on to become the key landmark case that that influenced the decision in Brown. Nobody, nobody heard about it. I wrote about it recently um, because of an effort to start educating people about it. And I don't know how many people came up to me and said, wow, that was really interesting. I never heard about that before. They never heard about it because they weren't taught about it. So um, it's kind of crazy that we have this backlash against teaching our own history right now, but we need, we need educated voters in this country too. We're, I'm not just talking about employment and the value to employers. I'm talking about value to society. And I think a better informed public is a more responsible, healthy, public and um and that's something to keep in mind as well 
you know, this, this, it, this talking about an informed society and educated society, uh, you know, it, 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 in this society, everything comes down to cost. So, you know, to me, this seems like a good spot where we could talk about some of your, one of your passions besides inequality in education, but something just as related uh, is uh, the student loan debt crisis, which is something that is very pa a passionate topic for you, one where you were even featured in a MSNBC documentary. Um, so what what are some of your thoughts? What is your take on America's 1.5, 1.4 trillion in student loan debt? It's all, it's actually close to 2 trillion now. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's a huge uh, bubble that's getting ready to burst. Um, it, it's a big problem. Um, yeah, so this documentary that I was in for like a nanosecond um, is really great. Uh, if anybody wants to see it, it's called Lone Wolves, and that's Lone, L-O-A-N. Um, as Kevin mentioned, it, uh, it originally um, appeared on MSNBC, and it now streams on Peacock. Um, it's by a filmmaker and journalist named uh, Blake Zeff, uh, Z-E-F-F, a -F, uh, really smart guy, used to work in government. Um, and he, uh, he took on this issue. And one thing he found out, and um, the major point of this documentary, um, in the course of, of reporting, he discovered that uh, one of the big problems with student loan debt is that it is one of the very few kinds of debt that cannot, um, cannot be uh, dismissed in bankruptcy. Um, and it's all due to uh, this massive education bill that was passed back in the 1990s. And it was just like one little line that was slipped into this massive bill that kind of nobody knew about um, that exempted, in essence, student loan debt from bankruptcy. And, and we're talking like, I mean, other kinds of debt, like, like gambling debts, you can have dismissed in bankruptcy, credit card debt, like all, there's so many other kinds of debt. It, it's just crazy, but not student loan debt. And what that in effect does is it, um, it disincentivizes lenders from, uh, from, behavior we don't want to see, sort of predatory lending. So you've got um, a lot of times young students who are, you know, signing on the dotted line thinking, you know, I'll, I'll take out this loan because it's the only way I can afford to go to college and I'm going to have this great career after I finish and I'll be able to pay it back. But then they find out many, many years later when they're out and they're in their career and some of them, yes, are in successful careers. They might be teachers or doctors or, you know, whatever. They're, they're contributing to society. And there's this little thing called compound interest where, um, again, because the lenders can impose whatever terms they want, in effect, um, they are paying interest upon interest. So whatever your original amount of debt was, it grows and grows and grows over time, even though you're making your payments. So um, people have insane amounts of debt and it's holding them back in so many ways. Um, there are some pretty tragic stories in, in the film. Um, and one of the ways it's holding people back is they are, because they have this debt hanging over their heads, hanging over their lives, they're not doing a lot of the things that they thought they were going to do. They're not taking the job, the passion job that they wanted. They're starting families later. They're not buying houses because they can't afford it. Um, so it, even if, you know, I don't have student debt, 
but I'm an American, I am paying the price for it because it affects all of us. When so many people in our country are weighed down by debt, it's a drag on our economy, it's a drag on our society. So, so Patrice, um, you know, I, I actually teach at a, at a community college and the, the debt loads that some of them are carrying is not as high, obviously, as it might be at a, at a Stanford or UCLA or, or, or someplace like that. But I do, I do know that some of them, one of the problems we have at community college is that um, some of them start and stop out and with the intention of starting again and then end up sometimes not coming back and they still have that debt, whether they finished or not. So they still yeah. have that on their plate. Um and don't have the job that they had been going for in, in the first place. Um, but but I also, I'm wondering how, how did we get here to, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I paid off my student loans finally about, I don't know, six or seven years ago in my, in my early forties. Um, <laughs> so, you know, but I was also very fortunate. I, I had some support from my family, actually quite a bit of support from my family during my undergraduate years. And then, you know, went through, I uh, had, had a teaching assistantship during my master's degree. So I, I was very fortunate in some ways. I was also fortunate that I was doing this in the early to mid to late nineties. It seems like to me, because it seems to me that something happened sometime in the nineties where the acceleration of the cost just got out of control. And I'm wondering what you, what you think, you know, do you, do you kind of agree that that's when it happened? Did it start to happen earlier or later as far as when the acceleration of the cost happened? And how do you think we got here? How do you think we got to the point where it became so um, kind of absurdly expensive in comparison to where it was maybe in the 70s or 80s or, or before that even? Yeah, I, you know, I don't unfortunately have a great answer for that. Um, I, I'm most familiar with what's going on in California. But um, again, I can I can trace in, in California, the public universities here used to get um, most of their funding from the state. And after Proposition 13 passed, which I mentioned before, that, um, that was a big reason why that funding um, started to be cut. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the amount of funding that schools like UCLA um, get from the state is just a tiny fraction of what, what they once did. So when I went to UCLA back in the prehistoric age, um, it cost practically nothing to go there. And it was, you know, it's a great university. It's one of the top universities in the world, um, or so I'm told. Um, that's another subject, college rankings that I get riled up about. Um, but I mean, to go there now, yeah, a lot of people have to go into debt for a public school, never mind all the, the private uh, universities that, you know, cost more than than most people's homes. It It's a problem. I, I don't, unfortunately, know um, the perfect answer to that, um, but I think a lot of people are starting to talk at least about um, how we can address that issue and make college more affordable. Again, I think it comes down to, um, do we have the, the will to really do something about it in this country? Um, I'm doubtful, unfortunately, I'm doubtful. Um, I think that the trend we've seen in recent years is increased stratification um, between the haves and have nots. And um, a lot of that is driven by the high price of education. And I, I think in recent years, since we have seen more publicity about uh, student loan debt, I think a lot of people are being dissuaded who otherwise would consider going to college from doing that. I don't know, you know, the, the numbers don't necessarily bear that out. We're still seeing record college applications, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion we might see that start to turn around in the next few years. I wanted to say something real quick. I think in the case of California, in terms of student debt, 
you saw the early stages of this model of student debt servitude um, with uh, when Reagan was the governor of California, when Reagan's um, education advisor explicitly said, we don't want an educated populace that's debt free that might take to the streets and protest or demand change to the system, right? I mean, if you have people in permanent debt servitude that they can't get out of, I mean, they have to keep they have to keep grinding and they don't have, you know, they don't have the energy sometimes. That's that's one thing I think that's I mean, student debt is one piece, big piece of the puzzle, right? Right, of modern American life. Everyone sees everyone has different diagnosis and, and on different idea of what what the causes are but i mean there's a lot of people that don't believe in the current american dream for a variety of reasons and i just think about you think about how many people prior are, are dissuaded like you were saying applications are up but how many people are dissuaded from law school or medical school because of the debt load even though they're going to make a lot of money it's still going to take a long time to pay that debt off how, how many people that could be great lawyers Look at that debt load of $150,000, $200,000, and they say, ah, no, I don't, I don't, I'm, I, I'm going to go do something else. And I don't know if, if you have a thought on that, um, but I'm going to yield the floor. So I, I, can you guys hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll just jump in here and, and cause that's, that's really personal to me. Um, one of my sons is a lawyer and he graduated from law school last spring and is now a working lawyer. And um, uh, we've talked about this a lot of how fortunate he was that um, my husband and I were able to help him. And um, he was able to graduate debt free and start out his career debt free. And he knows very well how fortunate he is. You know, not all his uh, former uh, classmates and colleagues are are so lucky. Um, in in the film Lone Wolves, one of the people interviewed is um, a physician, and she really wanted to. Um, go back and serve her community and uh, a, like a low income community and work in, uh, I believe, like more of a clinic setting or something, but in a job that would not pay enough for her to pay off her loans. So she was forced to take a job um, just so she had enough money to pay off her loans and she still feels like she's just barely treading water you know so your point is absolutely 100 percent right that um that it's it's affecting us in so many insidious ways um but it's also um a huge as i mentioned before a huge economic problem a lot of economists are starting to warn that um the overall debt um, that that bubble is going to burst. And when it does, um, the economic meltdown we had um, in 2007, 2008 is going to, you know, is going to repeat itself. So, so Patrice, uh, th thank you again. And, you know, you, you talking about this reminds me, um, I, I mentioned I, I teach at community college many years ago. Uh, 20 years ago now, I briefly taught at a, a few different community colleges in the Bay Area, in, in, in San Francisco Bay Area. And I can remember it was uh, City College of San Francisco at that time charged $11 per semester hour. $11 per semester hour, not quarter, but semester hour. Of course, bo books and fees and all that sort of thing too. But nonetheless, and when I, when I tell my students that here, um, you know, even if we adjust, I'm, I'm sure it's more than that now. I don't know where, where they are now. I'm sure it's quite a bit more than that now. Um, but nonetheless, and the fact that there was a time when, you know, Berkeley, you could go to for, for free. I mean, there was a time when that was the case. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if in, in talking about this, 
you know, again, we have we might might still have a lot of applications, a lot of people wanting to go in. I, I worry that, as you said, or as, as a couple of us have said, that maybe we're going to see a shift. I've heard some students say that they that actually in papers say to me as a as an instructor say to me in papers that they feel like education is a scam at this point, almost like it's a grift. Um, and that's, you know, obviously not something that feels very good for me as, as a teacher to hear. That's not, not how I want them to see it. As you er mentioned earlier, the critical thinking, the creative thinking, we need those things. And as I think Kevin sort of alluded to as well, we need those things, sure, for job skills, for all those kinds of things. We need them as human beings, arguably, and we need the, the soft skills and we need the arts and all these kinds of things. So my my fear is that more and more people are going to go away and then what what do you think society looks like if people revolt in that direction instead if they just say we're just not going to do it it's too expensive we're just not going to do it we'll we'll find some other way to survive we'll find some other way to live uh what what are your thoughts there oh wow <laughs> uh, yeah Oh, that's, you know, I, I'm not surprised that some of your students are saying that. And, um, and in a way, they're not wrong. I mean, it's, it's cynical, sure. Um, but I understand where that impulse is coming from. Um, God, I don't know. I mean, you know, are, are we going to have hunger games? I, I, you know, I don't know where that leads. That is a fascinating question. Um, I would hope it would finally break the back of, of the sort of educational overlords right now. And we would see some real reform start to happen. Um, I think but, if I may, yeah. can I, if I may jump in. And the, other, the other thing, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the other thing is, I think what tends to happen is when the system is um skewed as i think we all agree it, it, it is skewed in 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 various contexts education health uh and so on and so forth um when parts of the parts of the system are skewed like that people have a tendency to shoot the messenger as it were so instead of instead of doing things like uh productive instead of making productive changes what they'll do is they'll attack they'll attack the science for example it's something that Carl Sagan says, right? Oh, you know, so they, they, it's this, so Pierre Bourdieu, a sociologist, would call this refusing what one is refused, which is kind of counterproductive, you know? Um, you, ref, you refuse what you are refused. You attack the very, the very principles of science because you're locked out and it's kind of like a, a petulant kind of response to the problem instead of something that, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with the with well, there are things wrong with science, but um, there's the logic and reason. And these are good things that should be accessible to everybody. Critical thinking; these are not things that need to be attacked, as they are now in the current. I would argue, anyway, in the current kind of identity politics, social justice era. I think that's the wrong way to go about things. I think what you've said, Patrice, that we should uh, we should encourage those kinds of things and not see them as white or black or because that's racializing things and i think that that's kind of really counterproductive way you know i go back to people and you said that there's um there's an anti-science kind of uh attitude right in, in western societies generally and this goes back three four five decades i mean i i think about um unweaving the rainbow for example by richard dawkins and i think about you know um the pale blue dot Carl Sagan, when you when you say these things, um, or um, you know, um, uh, the Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan as well. All of you know this kind of this general this this kind of souping up of kind of mysticism and New Age spirituality and stuff, which has its place, but the, this is coupled with a kind of denigration of science and critical thinking and reason. And I just think it's just so counterproductive because, as Chad said. We need these, we need, these are kind of life skills apart from anything else. You don't need to be in a laboratory with a white coat, you know, on testing rats and things. It's not just for people in, in laboratories. It's these are, you know, this is what Carl Sagan said in, in the burden of represent, um, uh, the burden of uh, skepticism. 
for example. You know that we need these as life skills in in, in democratic in in democratic. It, it's kind of um, in democratic context. It's kind of um, it's it, it's treated like a right, but it's more like a it, it, it's it's more of a kind of it's not so much a right as a kind of duty almost to be well informed as well informed as possible. But you also need to have the means to acquire the knowledge in the first place, which is what you were saying in the beginning. I mean, yeah, aside from just like googling it or you know doing some deep dive into some corner of the the internet. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's pretty crazy. Every time I've written uh, about um, vaccine and vaccine denial, I've never received so many threats. And, you know, I've been a journalist my whole career. We're kind of used to people getting mad at us and getting some pretty ugly backlash against what we write, but not like this, you know, crazy, crazy threatening stuff. So it's like, where, where is that coming from? You know, people who are so, so crazed by the idea of, you know, a, a proven science backed uh, public health, uh, you know, a, a advancement that has saved millions and millions of lives. Um, they've been so radicalized um, because, because they, you know, I believe because, you know, they don't know how to sort the false information from, you know, the legitimate stuff. Um, and again, I think, you know, you could take any problem like that and, and go back to, you know, well, why, why didn't they have the proper education that teaches them how to, you know, how, how to, uh, discern what is real information or what is legitimate information or, or just how to analyze what they're seeing, um, you know, that, that, that's a huge problem. Um, this is, this is something else I just wanted to bring up and you guys didn't ask about this. Um, when I was talking about college admissions and the whole problem with that, um, one, one other little change that is starting to happen that again, when I talked about some change ar around the edges, um, it gives me a little glimmer of hope. Um, is that the, um, the college ranking system is starting to crumble uh, a little bit. Um, and I think that is maybe a healthy sign. Um, so I don't know why we have an obsession with ranking things. We rank everything, you know, we rank toasters and, you know, I mean, any, any kind of appliance we buy, well, this is the number one, this is the number two. Um, we always have to look at what, how is this thing ranked? And we do the same things with our schools. Um, the higher it's ranked, the better we think it is, but better according to who? Well, the according to who with colleges in this country, for the most part has been um, US News and World Report, which for some reason became the standard bearer in, um, in college rankings. And it's now um, been exposed enough that their method of uh, ranking colleges is, um, is not great. Um, a lot of the information is self-reported by the universities. Some of it has been, it's now coming to light, has been fudged. Um, some of it's based on, um, on measures that really don't mean anything. Um, I would argue SAT scores, but um, uh, uh, I, I believe they've taken those out now. But um, one thing, for example, is um, the, uh, the rate at which um, people are admitted. So like, for example, the Ivy Leagues obviously have very low admissions rates. So they get all these applications and they only admit a very tiny, tiny percentage. Well, that must mean it's really good, right? Because only the very best people get in. But again, it, it's just all BS because uh, first of all, um, universities 
market themselves like crazy. They are marketing machines. They market the brand and they go around the country telling kids, go ahead and apply. You never know, you might get in. And everybody who is within striking distance of that GPA that they think might qualify them to get in, yeah, they go ahead and apply because they think, what the heck, I've got a chance. They don't have a chance. But you get these this huge swelling of applications. So what we've seen is this effect where kids are now applying to tons of schools, right? A lot of kids apply to a dozen, sometimes more schools. I know kids that have applied to more than 20 universities, right? So you apply to that many schools, each school is getting more applications. So it just has grown and grown and it's mushroomed. And then the school gets to brag about their low acceptance rate. And that goes into their ranking. The higher the ranking, the better we think they are. The better we think they are, the more people want to go there. And it's, again, when you talked about, you know, vicious cycles and virtuous cycle, this is a vicious cycle that we have created in this country. And it's all it's based. Kind of, it's huge. kind of self-sabotage, self right, really, ah. from all sides, from all sides. Like I said, like we've been saying, on the right, you've got the, you've got the greed and you've got the, you've got the, the lone wolves, as, 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 as they're described. In the film and you've got this structure of debt and on the never never and you've got this like kevin was saying people get put off they don't want to go to college because they don't want to be burdened with saddled with that debt throughout life they'll never get rid of it it's the same in the uk uh the average student debt is i think 40 something thousand pounds or something i don't know when they leave um so that's one side and then like i said on the other side you've got the other side of the self-sabotage which is to attack the system as you know being evil and necessarily and you, you, so i think we, we're looking at two it's kind of being it's, a, it's kind of being attacked from both sides and it's it's a kind of self-sabotage in a way it seems to me what do you think oh yeah absolutely um but and and the other point i wanted to make too is um when we talk about well is it really worth it but you know you could get a good education uh, at you know at a community college some community colleges are awesome. You know, you know, you guys are all educators. Uh, there are different ways of going about it. Um, you know, I know lots of, of young people who went to community college. They did well. They went on to a four-year school. They did well. They went on to something else. They've had successful lives, successful careers. Nobody looks at them and goes, oh, you went to a community college? No. No, that's crazy. It's it's not, you know, where you start out, it's where you end up, you know? If you keep a goal in sight or if if you have if you have the motivation to learn and to make something happen with your life, you can do that no matter where you are. So when I talk about the value of education, it's not necessarily in a particular kind of structure. Um it can be what you make of it, but we need to give people the opportunities that allow them to make that happen. Yeah, I think uh, I just wanted to say one last thing here. <clears throat> there's there's many, one of the positives I think to the system here is that there's many ways to kind of like find, if, if, if the debt is not an issue, there'd be many ways for people to find their way to a path to success or to a prestigious school. Like, you know, I, I have a friend of mine who did not go to prestigious high school and went to community college and then from community college developed a love of Chinese and then went to Berkeley for his bachelor's degree and then did his master's and his PhD at a Chinese top Chinese university. And he's a, he, he is not from privilege. He's not from an affluent background. Um, and actually, to be honest, one of the reasons he went to China was that master's degree and PhD were free. We're free, you know, and, and I remember when he finished and now he, you know, he's a professor and, uh, and he said, you know, 
what am I going to do? Go back to America and be, and he, this is a brilliant guy. He speaks fluent Chinese. He writes about Chinese philosophy. You know, he's writing like a 20,000 character dissertation, but he said, I'm not going to go back to the U S and be a barista with a PhD. And, you know, he's found way more opportunities going that direction. So that's, that's the thing. We have to create a system where like, self-made people aren't like hey i'm out of here i'm gonna go somewhere else where i'm not indebted for life especially if they don't mind living outside of the country and uh i wanted to give everyone one last chance and i wanted to i wanted to actually see like what's next for you on the journalism front and what are some of the things you're working on well um i will continue to write my column and write about the very topics that we have discussed. Um, every time I think about, well, maybe I should, maybe I should hang it up and you know, do something else with my life. I think, but I still want to write about this. I still want to, you know, if I can, if I can reach anybody with with these thoughts and get people to at least start thinking about these issues, then I feel like. I've accomplished something. Um, I would love to write another book. Um, I have a few ideas, which I can't talk about yet, but I would love to do that. <laughs> um, and um, and I know we were gonna talk about travel. We probably don't have time for that, but, um, but I definitely have more travel on the horizon. So that's- Well, you can come back. You can come back. We, we'll know, have a travel. Yeah. yeah, we we we're not at the point where we have like you know six months of book guests, so come back anytime, you know. Uh, and uh, if we ever do get to the point where we have six months of book guests, which probably won't happen, but if it did, we, we will <laughs> always be at the front of the line. Oh, thanks. So, uh, but we we're all travelers and stuff. So yeah, I want to I want to thank you for coming on and um, you know um and just sharing some of your work and your passions about student debt, uh, education inequality, which I mean, since we're, we've all been involved in education, I know we're all interested in that. And uh, thanks for your time. Guys, do you have any last thoughts or Thanks very much. Else? I really enjoyed reading those pieces as well. They were really, really interesting. Yeah, especially well, the, well, we talked about some of the stuff. It was really great stuff. Thank you, Patrice. Well, it's been a, a real pleasure, and um, and I appreciate all the um, really intriguing questions you asked, and um, and what you're doing with the podcast. It's really great. And thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for listening to our podcast before you came on. You know, I appreciate it. <laughs>